Well, on behalf of Nikita and I, thank you and welcome. Welcome to this day. I think we're going to have a very deep, profound day. I hope that it is very enriching for you. And, and uh, I think of the, the words empower, help. Uh, empowerment is very important. And basically that's just returning your mind to its natural state because all power is of God of spirit, of love, of oneness. And the teachings are very uncompromising in that there is no power but that. So everything that we consider power, military power, or all different forms of worldly power, martial arts, uh, intelligence, power that comes with intelligence, power that comes with money, power that comes with all these other things are all fictitious. They've all been made up. They really don't come from spirit at all. It's a, it's a deception to think that you can achieve power in the world. It's a deception to think that you can achieve or accomplish power with a body identification. Because the body was made by the ego to take the place of our Christ self, our real self, our true eternal self. And so whenever we invest power, intelligence, skills, all kinds of things, uh, if you want true empowerment, you have to go back to your mind. I would say divine mind. We'll work with right mind and wrong mind with the Course in Miracles, but that's just a discernment to come back to alignment. Right mind is just alignment with Source. And so, in the end, A Course in Miracles is not a dualistic path. It's a path to oneness. It's a path that says God is love, God is one, and that's the reality. That's the reality that, that we come from. So, it's really good, we can start to take it in deeply. And health, too, is another word, since we're talking in power health. Health, as it's defined by Jesus in A Course in Miracles, is, is inner peace. So we need to stick with that. Because if you're striving for health in the body, you're striving for health in a neutral image that actually has no meaning whatsoever. It's actually an oxymoron. Everyone know what an oxymoron is? It's a contradiction in terms to talk about bodily health. It's a symbol, and that symbol can reflect, if you're feeling peaceful, joyful, happy, then that symbol can reflect that. It just, it just means that you won't feel pain, suffering, hurt, uh, all the things that, that are projections of the ego. But also it means that your search should be inward. The Kingdom of Heaven is within. The Kingdom of Heaven is a state of mind that's very natural, but it's not going to be found in a body, which is part of a projection that was made as a veil to cover over the reality of who we are. So Empower Health is basically saying, come back to the power of who you are in, in God, in love, and also come to that inner peace. And inner peace Basically, the thing that's striking about it is that all of the goals of the world, and I mean all of them inclusively, and all of the roadways of the world were made to, to keep you from knowing who you are. Sounds like very much like Morpheus in the Matrix. The Matrix is control. It was set up to keep you from knowing who you are. And it's set up with linear time. Uh, again, eternity and time cannot coexist. So, I would say if you're going to invest in something, invest in your eternity, because that will never pass away. That's the, the peace that passeth the understanding of the world. You're not going to find peace of mind, or power, or glory, or anything in any of the symbols of this world. The Holy Spirit can use what the ego made to take you back to that eternity. So there's nothing wrong with anything of the world. It's just symbols and images that were made by the ego. But the Holy Spirit's use of those symbols becomes extremely important. You do not speak your own words. Let the Spirit put the words in your mouth. Let the Spirit smile through you, laugh through you, sing through you, hug through you. Give it all to God. Give it all to Spirit. And know then who you really are. And that self is not contained in a body. Jesus tells us that the Savior of the world is not a body or in a body. 
so we don't need to keep going back and forth. Am I a spiritual being having a human experience or a human being having a spiritual experience? It's neither of those. We are a spiritual being and period. The Christ. If you follow the teachings, if you go for it with everything you've got, you will realize you will not have a wish to tarry in time and space when eternity is calling you, when love is calling you. When love calls, you want to answer. You don't want to hesitate with, hmm, I just got a few more things to work out here. <laughs> you want it, we want it to be a resounding yes. So for me, that in the parable of David, that's been very important because A Course in Miracles came across my path, or I should say, instead of me finding it, it found me about three decades ago, 30 years ago. And then about 25 years ago, a quarter of a century, is when I began seeming to travel and move about and just be used as a, as a mouthpiece for the Holy Spirit and for Jesus. And that is what guarantees health. That's what guarantees empowerment. That's what guarantees the joy, the happiness. It's being uncompromising in following that. To say the words, I want the peace of God, and to mean them are two different things. We're reminded in the workbook. If you have to mean it, and when, what does that even mean, to mean I want the peace of God? Well, peace is a present state of mind. So if peace is your goal, you have just adopted a present goal. Doesn't that sound funny when all of us have been raised and conditioned to think of goals in the future? And now we're given a present goal. You see how different that is from all the pursuits of the world. Are you pursuing fame, money, Are you pursuing success as the world defines it? Are you pursuing anything, any goal? You can name it in terms of the world, or are, is your focus present peace? So Jesus says, you may notice how different the goal of this course are from your current goals or your, your goals in terms of the world. It's the exact opposite. To have a present goal would be coming a little closer to the section in the Course in Miracles, I need do nothing. If you really got into the idea of peace of mind is my only goal, you would be taken into a state of mind in which you need do nothing. There is no sense of, of pressure, there is no sense of lack, there is no sense of have to, should, ought to, must. Wow, that must be a fun life to live a life without shoulds, ought tos, have to, must. You know, I think any child that was told by a parent, listen, I love you unconditionally, have fun on planet Earth, I'm here to support you in everything. You may make mistakes, that's okay, everyone seems to make mistakes. I'm here to pick you up when you fall down, I'm here to hug you, love you, support you. You can't mess it up. What about your future? Well, let this, leave that to the spirit. Good grades? No, nah, not important. Education? No. <laughs> Pursuing, you know, achieving, accomplishing, carving out your niche in the world? No, 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 no. I'd rather you be happy. Just be happy. I'm here to support you in being happy. I get to do that with the people that I live and work with. You know, they call me up and working at the center, working with people, and then people start to leave and go play, oh, it's getting empty here, did I do something wrong? No, you didn't, no. There's not donations coming, that's all right. There's no problem. Remember, you're here to be happy. You have one function, is to be happy. And the discernment is coming <coughs> to being happy by following the spirit, not following the ego, because the ego will generate its own version of happiness. And that, that involves becoming something, attaining something, you know, achieving something in the world. It's a timeline. Achieve the goals of the timeline and then you'll be happy. And all of us have tried that. And I would say, we could say with a resounding, has it ever brought us a lasting happiness by attaining and achieving and accumulating and all this? No. It never brought us lasting happiness. 
the goal was still in the future. Even future awakening and future enlightenment, that's another goal. It becomes a trap, you know, then you're on this constantly going to satsangs and seminars and workshops and psychodramas and, and therapy and on and on and on and on. And you know what? That's all part of the spinning wheel too. Not that there's some helpful elements in all those things, if given over to the spirit. It can be very useful. It can be a fast track if given over. But you're not asked to to stop on one of the rungs of the ladder and just decide, okay, here's a rung. I kind of like it. I've done pretty good. Look at all those rungs below me. <laughs> so, uh, I've gone pretty far. I'll just camp out here. Put my tent down, my sleeping bag, my stakes. Look at all those other rungs. I'm better than all the rest. No, spirit doesn't understand degrees. Spirit doesn't even understand rungs. Those are just concepts that the Holy Spirit can use, so you keep pushing off, and pushing off, and pushing off. Never resting content. Think not that you know what anything is for, until you have passed the test of perfect peace. You are clueless until you pass the test of perfect peace. Your peace of mind is constant. And I'll tell you, if you think you're clueless on the way, you're really clueless <laughs> in that state of mind. It's more like the Chauncey Gardner being their state. I like to watch, Chauncey says. He's a, he's a witness, he's a watcher of the world. But he's not involved in the outcomes. He's not concerned where he stands. He doesn't have that comparison, you know, where am I, where do I stand on the journey? There's six stages of the development of trust in the Course. It's only the ego ask, what stage am I on? <laughs> Some people tell me, I think I'm on all six simultaneously. I'm very confused, <laughs> because we're thinking, you know, you just clear one, then you move on to two, then three, four. But in the end, the last stage is the stage of perfect peace. And I know some of you who studied the Course, have you noticed that four of the six are difficult, uncomfortable, challenging. That's two-thirds. For any of you that are on this journey and you want a little peek into how it's going to go. My friend Suzanne, one time she listened to one of my talks and she said, so basically what I'm getting from your talks is the way that the spiritual journey is going to go is Damn, 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 ah! <laughs> I said, yeah, that's it, very good. <laughs> and that's why we joined together. In the midst of the seeming damn, 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 damn. For a moment today, hopefully we'll, we'll go in, that you'll experience a quantum moment of happiness for no earthly reason today. That's really what you want, and, and in the heart of your hearts, that's what you're praying for, it's just happiness for no earthly reason. Happiness that doesn't involve consequences. Happiness that doesn't involve outcomes. Happiness like those old Eastern story where the, the farmer's son, you know, is working and the farmer's, uh, farmer gets hurt. Is that good or bad? We shall see. And the son takes over on the farm, but then the son gets coughed off, called off to war. There's a whole long series of things with the son, and all you hear is, we shall see. An open-ended question. It's actually a statement, we shall see, we shall reach a state of mind that's beyond judging the form. And we shall see with the vision of Christ, with the vision of Spirit, which is perfect spiritual vision. And you cannot achieve this spiritual vision with the body. You cannot even achieve this spiritual vision with words, because I know the Course is three books, a lot of words, 31 chapters, 365 lessons, and what happens is the ego tries to hop on the journey and says, I'm going to be a Course in Miracles scholar, or a Course in Miracles writer, a Course in Miracles, I'm going to do that for my career. I'm going to be a Course in Miracles expert, a Course in Miracles professional, or whatever. No, you can't marry anything of this world with the Spirit. You've got to let it all go. 
the caterpillar has to shed the skin to go into the metamorphosis of the butterfly and fly away. The butterfly doesn't carry all that baggage up into, into flight. It has to leave it behind. And so that's really what we're called to do. Some of you remember quotes from the Bible. I think St. Francis was, was very fond of quoting, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. I now am born again. That just means that the ego projected out time and space, the ego, ego projected the body, the ego projected the flesh, and as long as you hold your identity with the flesh, you deny the awareness of the spirit. People say, what about Jesus? He seemed to be flesh. He seemed to be the spirit. Doesn't he kind of qualify as a middle, a middle ground there? Well, we could say that in the Bible it says the Word was made flesh. In the Course in Miracles, Jesus says, strictly speaking, that is impossible. The Word of God is Spirit. The Word of God is, I am as God created me. It's pure Spirit. And Spirit cannot become flesh. Jesus was a symbol of this time-space world that the ego made, of the Holy Spirit using what the ego made to point, like the Zen Master pointing to the moon, pointing to the light. You're going to have to forgive Jesus in the end. You're going to have to forgive the apostles. You're going to have to forgive all the saints, forgive all the history, and come with holy empty hands unto thy God. You're going to have to forgive everything of time and space, without exception. So this pathway is actually a very direct, and very simple, and very straightforward. Not to the ego, but to the ego, everything is complicated and difficult. You might have noticed that voice in your mind that does the complaining, that always has the doubts, that's always self-critical, that's the ego. And the ego will never awaken. Because the ego, by definition, is the belief that there is no God, that love is impossible. It's a death wish. I think the first, one of the first times I came to Canada, I think I was up in Edmonton, and. I was invited to a religious science church. I said, oh, religious science, that's Ernest Holmes, it's pretty open. And they're doing like a 10, 12, 15 week uh, series on the Buddha. I said, oh, this is a really open-minded church. A church that does a series on the Buddha? I like that. But when I got there and spoke, uh, I was only five or ten minutes into my talk, and some elderly woman in the front, she said, hey, 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 stop, stop. You've got nothing good to say about the ego. Uh, come on now, let's lighten up a little bit. I was only 10 minutes into my talk. This was an open my nature. If I took a long drink, my water, the water always on hand. And then I, I looked out at her and I said, the ego wants you dead. And I continued on with my talk. <laughs> uh, interrupted. But, when I, there was another course teacher who was coming some weeks later, and I saw a memo from the minister at the church, and he said, uh, we're a little wary of Course in Miracles teachers, because of the controversial nature of the previous speaker. <laughs> controversial nature? I wasn't controversial in the least bit. Tell it like it is. Give it to me straight. Don't mess it up in with all kind of other metaphors and everything. Just give it straight. We're removing our mind's attention from a death wish. We're not trying to mollycoddle the ego. We're not even trying to love the ego. How do you love a death wish, you know? Carl Jung said, no, you expose it. You expose the shadow. You expose it and you see it's unreality. You pull your mind away from it by raising it up into awareness. That's what all our transpersonal psychology, our psychodrama, all of our workshops, everything we're doing when we're allowing those emotions up into awareness is good. Because we're simply exposing a puff of nothingness. We're exposing a belief that, sh that really isn't deserving of our mind's attention. That's why it heals. But there also must come a point where if you've done all the psychodrama, psychotherapy, and you've done these things, I think I hear that complaint mostly is that people said, I've been doing this for 20 years, or 30 years, or 40 years. 
I want to actually know how I can have a breakthrough. And I said, good, now you're ready for the topic of true empathy, of staying with what's real and true, and, and seeing only what's real and true, because that's what you have in your mind. My mind holds only what I think with God. Beyond the drama, beyond the mirroring, beyond the conflict, there is a point that goes beyond right and wrong and good and bad, and all the dualities of the world, and it is just a state of pure atonement, a pure alignment with spirit. And that is the presence of love. And you must come to an end of the searching. And you must recognize it. And you must come to an end of the pursuits. You must come to an end of the compromise, of trying to have a compromised identity that still falls short of your Christ nature, your Christ being, your Buddha nature. You must come to an end of this pursuit. So, I've been having some great lunches over the years, going back about 12 years with the publisher of A Course in Miracles, Judy Scutch and her husband William Whitson, and we were going through, we went through a few lunches um, about 12 years ago, and recently we just I've had three or four more lunches with them, and Finally, um, I brought up the topic of, of the ancient mystery schools, and um, Judy lit up and she said, that's it. When, when Helen and Bill first received this material, they said, you know what this stuff is? It's a mystery school. It's kind of esoteric. It's, it's hidden. It's not for public consumption. <laughs> it's too, too radical. It's too deep to be out there among the masses which is what the mystery schools were about. You had to come and go into the mystery of letting go of all your concepts of who you are, come to the, the divine nature. So uh, the first time, Judy was the publisher of the course, so the first time she went to Helen and she said, how many books shall we make? How, ma how much for the first print run, you know, how much we should have? And basically, Judy said, Helen looked at her and said, uh, four. <laughs> now Judy's in the role of the publisher. She's like, four, four, hundred thousand? No, forty thousand? No, Helen said no. I said four. Helen's pretty sharp, you know. She she's a professor. She said, I know my numbers. I said four. <laughs> he said four. Who was the four? Well, the four of us: Ken, <laughs> Helen, Bill, and Judy. You know. See how practical, but you see how the, those were more in line with the mystery school feeling. Like, whoa, this is deep. It's not really ready. There's many people who want to hear it, and they were pretty still, Helen was concerned about her reputation, you know, first of all, you know, research psychologists said, here's voices, they usually lock, <laughs> the psychologists lock those people up. <laughs> so if you put it out, oh, I've just channeled the work from Jesus Christ, it says give up the world and come back to God. And, lock her up. Though she was not too thrilled about publishing. She, Helen at the beginning even, you know, she all the way through her life, she really, she never really felt the course was even to be translated into other languages. It's only with Judy and the, those that have followed that we have now 25 translations of A Course in Miracles. But Helen's original, no, don't translate. <laughs> you know, and four. <laughs> you know. So we have to come at the spiritual awakening where you open up the course and you just have to think, this is just for me. This is spirit coming in a form of all the different forms. It's just coming in a form and reaching me in a very direct way and saying, this is just for my mind. This is for my awakening. How many teachers of God does it take to save the world? One. Guess who that one is? <laughs> it's our mind. It's our shared mind. It's not a personality, but it's our mind is here to wake up, we're here to receive the truth and to go for it. Now, for Judy and Ken and Bill and Helen, you know, they they uh, were basically told that before they would actually be given the next instruction to publish the course, they would have to pray and receive instruction. So they had these black binders with all this great material, but basically they were told by the voice that they would have to pray, and when they all prayed, they waited, waited. Ken heard nothing. Bill heard nothing. Helen heard nothing. And 
Then Helen said, it's Judy. Helen had a really good contact with her. Like, here's the pointer, <laughs> it's Judy. And then Judy heard, make the commitment first. No more instructions about this Course in Miracles until you first make the commitment. What does that even mean? Make the commitment to spend your whole life devoted to experiencing what this Course is pointing towards. No more instructions until you make the commitment first. So, let's look at uh, the commitment idea. I remember I was doing a, a gathering in Kentucky years ago, and my friend William Weiss, he came down there, and we were having deep sessions, lots of emotions coming up out in the, the woods of Kentucky, and, and finally, a friend of mine, Lisa, started saying, well, you know, William, it's going to take a commitment. He said, don't say that word. So the whole thing was, we were laughing, don't say the C word, please. Don't say the C word. And finally at the end he could say commitment. He got, he came down from Canada, he was able the whole retreat to, to get to the point where he could speak the word commitment. So the C word is not cancer, the C word is commitment. That's what's more terrifying. What's more terrifying than cancer? Commitment. <laughs> the mind would actually choose cancer over commitment to God. It's actually, it, it chooses illness because sickness is function unfulfilled. It would rather choose to not fill its function and, and try to die even. To not just die, but to try and suffer and die. As opposed to commit to God. The ego doesn't know what commitment is. So when I say commit, I'm saying your mind is going to have to commit to awakening. Your mind our mind has to commit to forgiveness. That's what Jesus was teaching 2,000 years ago. Judge not, lest you be judged. Commit. Commit to the plan of God. So I've been giving these talks and traveling for the last 25 years, and the same message has been coming through. It's like, make the commitment. What does it mean to put God first? It really means to put spirit first, and to start to let all the priorities, all the values, Everything you've ever learned before, to let that all start to fall away, like scales falling off, like leaves falling off a tree, like petals falling off a flower. You have to let everything that you've pursued drop away. Everything you've strived for, everything you believe you've achieved and you've accomplished, let them be like leaves in the fall, in the autumn, that just fall, blow off the tree. Let your mind be empty as the tree becomes empty in the winter. The winter has its place, the fall has its place. It's part of the seasons, the phases of letting go of the ego. What about money? What about survival? What about, you know, the practical things of this world? Well, I had to actually start to re let the Spirit redefine practicality for me, because I'll tell you, Following the Spirit and answering the call is the most practical, and I would say the only practical thing that you can do in your mind, in your life, is to answer the call. Jesus said, I am calling you out of the world. He meant, I'm calling you out of the thinking of the world. I'm calling you out of the ego's purpose of death. I'm calling you out of the ego's striving and comparing and judging. I'm not asking you necessarily to go live in a cave, live in a tree, you know, go off and be alone. That's more like traditional mysticism. But I am asking you to practice with my daily lessons and to really commit to staying present, to commit to emptying your mind, like Buddha had taught. Empty your mind of everything you think you think, think you know. Jesus is asking for the same commitment. My parable of David has kind of been a testimony of how that's definitely the way to go, because as I gave my life over, I let go of career, jobs, not, not all at once. You know, I had to keep asking Jesus about what would you like me to do, and I had student loans. You have to be practical. You can't just be like an ostrich and just kind of bury your head in, this, in the sand and pretend you don't have debts, pretend you don't have mortgages. Pretend you you have to be let the spirit unwind you from these ego traps. 
debt, scarcity, lack, stress, pressure. You have to be unwound in a practical way from all of those things. And that's what following the guidance is about. That's, that's what the Holy Spirit is here to do. It's here to give us practical guidance. So for me, when I took those big steps about, you know, it's beginning to be about 30 years ago, and then really 25 years ago when I started to travel, I, I took a lot of what the world would call leaps of faith. And then people may say over the years, oh, you, David, you learned how to live in divine providence, like like Mother Teresa and St. Francis and Peace Pilgrim and those things. No, and that's not even true either. Let's get past all that stuff too. You know, people don't live in divine providence. People are part of the problem. The ego people of the world. And the Holy Spirit is using that concept and that symbol to take us way beyond the idea of working for a living. You know, we were talking today, I was talking with a couple of people about, since I've come up here, about the high cost of living or the pr prices of real estate in Vancouver and the craziness and how it's getting way out of hand and everything. Oh, believe me, the ego belief system is out of hand. Vancouver's not out of hand. <laughs> Vancouver is in the Holy Spirit's hands and it's doing just fine, actually. Not crazy, not good or bad. Beautiful flow. It's part of the flow, like a, like the rest of the world. It's just flowing in the divine flow of God's love with the Holy Spirit. But it's it's not the things of the world that are good or bad. It's it's the seeming thinking of the ego that makes it so. These judges of what's good, what's bad, what's right, what's wrong. I'm telling you. There's a state of mind in which everything is flowing perfectly and always has been flowing perfectly, and there actually are no problems. So we'll have a fun day today. It's always fun when I come together with a group of friends and they try to tell me and convince me there's problems, and I say, I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm not experiencing them. It's always fun. Bring the light and the dark together. Problems, no problems. Let's see how that goes. When you turn a light on in a room, it's not dark anymore. It's not a fight that goes on. Is there no problem, no problem, no. It's the, the joy comes from the experience that there are no problems. There are no ecological problems. There are no military problems. There's no ozone problems. The Course of Miracles is, is saying very, very simply, what is the same cannot be different, and what is one cannot have separate parts. Well, that's important. What is the same spirit cannot be different. People talking about diversity, we have to learn how to accept diversity. Where do we get these crazy ideas about accepting diversity? When the ego made the diversity, and we're supposed to what, accept the ego? A death wish for our mind? Come on, we can do better than that. What is the same cannot be different. What is one cannot have separate parts. We have to come to a unified field, as they call it in, in quantum physics. Or Rumi said, there is a field. I will meet you there. The poets, the mystics, the saints, the quantum physicists, everybody is teaching the same thing is pointing towards oneness, pointing towards unification. That's what resonates in our heart when we're feeling that opening to the idea of oneness. We are one in the spirit. We like that word harmony. I like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. We like that. Even in the Coke commercial world. Sway. Yeah. <laughs> We don't care about the coke and the tell us that it eats up our intestines. No, we're, we're swaying and singing, you know, in perfect harmony. That's the joy. That's the joy of it all. So, we're trying to open up to the idea that Jesus stresses over and over in the Course. He says, bring your illusions to the truth. The problem with most spiritualities, seemingly, and most religions in the world is they try to bring God into the world. But if God is eternal and the world is temporary, why would you try to bring the eternal into the temporary? That doesn't make a lot of sense. 
Why would you try to bring the transcendent that's beyond all time and space, which is what spirit is, into time and space? Isn't that very familiar with the Tower of Babel? Remember the story of the Tower of Babel trying to build a temple high enough to reach God? Oh, it's backwards and those temples always fall down. Jesus tells us, none of your cities have stood the test of time. If you look at history, you will see that even famous cities have crumbled. And everything of time will crumble and pass away. Everything of time is temporary and passing. Everything of time and space is ephemeral. Why would you put your attention and your focus and your care on the ephemeral, on the temporary, when you could aim it at the eternal. You could aim it at the light and know who you are. The key to spiritual awakening is desire. Some of you have seen my levels of mind and the, the core in the center is desire. That's the prayer of your heart. Focus your desire on God, on spirit. Put all your face in that, and then you have no problems. There's this guy in the Bible back in the Psalms. The Psalms, remember that, David, back then? Maybe it's before our time. Mm -hmm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Mm -hmm. Pretty wise. Pretty good start. Now, you can say, well, that doesn't seem practical. I'm, I have lots of wants. But the Course is just saying, why don't you focus your wanting while you believe you have wants? Why don't you focus that on peace of mind? Instead of focusing on the form outcomes. Oh, I'll be happy in the future when I achieve this and accomplish this. Remember, we've all tried that many times. It never worked. Why would we keep trying the same things and keep failing when the kingdom of heaven is within. It's not going to be found in an outcome. There's a beautiful section in the, very late in the text of the Course called Beyond All Idols, where Jesus has a beautiful line that I just love to bring up. Spirit just brings it through me so much over these years. When you decide upon the form of what you want, you lose the understanding of its purpose. When you decide upon the form of what you want, you lose the understanding of its purpose. Form and content are, are inverse. If you're in the love, the form doesn't matter. Because love is everything. The form just can be a reflection of that love. But when you're in the lack, the form becomes very important. And you seek, you want out of lack. You want objects to fill that lack, and it never works. That's the trick of the ego. The ego's basic path is, seek for idols, and you shall be happy. And what's the Bible say? Hold no graven images, hold no idols before the Lord thy God. Exact opposite of the ego's teaching. This stuff's been around for centuries. It's been always been there. And the idols aren't just golden calves and, and golden statues, they're anything that we pursue in the entire cosmos. It could be anything. You may have a goal, like one day I hope there's space travel and I want to go visit a black hole. Because time is so different in black holes, you know. And there. No, that, that's still a goal. Whenever you try to, to figure something out. So, I want to start to go at some basic Misconceptions. This is mysticism 101, but I think it's important for all of us because people are so concerned about the ecology and they're telling me there's a big difference between a vegetarian and a meat eater. No, actually what is the same cannot be different and what is one cannot have separate parts. You have to come to such a unified perception that you empty your mind of meat eating and vegetarianism. All this stuff about organic food and chemical food. Who the hell cares when it's a projection of your mind and it's only your thoughts that can injure you? 
all this work at diet and nutrition. That's magic. Now, the Holy Spirit can use magic, but why is the Holy Spirit using the magic to unwind your mind from the belief in it? Not to, you don't end up with the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm, di I'm divine, I'm enlightened, I'm a vegetarian, I'm a breatharian, I'm a, a something or other, this and this. No, the Son of God is not defined by what he eats or breathes or doesn't breathe or anything. Oh, I'm a traveler. I travel, travel, travel. I, I traveled all over the world. Then I got into astral projection, and then I started, I started going visiting other planets. What the heck is this? I'm going to other galaxies. No, 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 no. No, no, no. That won't make you happy either. You're the Christ. The Christ is no traveler in time and space. Christ doesn't go anywhere. Christ doesn't travel. Christ doesn't live in time and space. Christ lives in God and eternity. Stuff about exercise, come on. I mean, I went through this stuff in the parable of David, you know, cardiovascular fitness, and eat right, and, and the tennis instructor, and did all these different things. Be fit, be fit, be fit, be fit. Exercise or your muscles will atrophy. Right? Have you heard this feel before? I've heard this for so many years now. God, I don't know how many decades. No, when I got into the glory of God and just started living by divine grace, by the mana from heaven, by the prana energy, by whatever you want to call it from any tradition, that was the end of that. I don't think about exercise, because exercise is a what? It's a concept. And that concept is, guess what? Sponsored by the ego. If you don't have a body, it's kind of hard to exercise, right? <laughs> People send me all this kind of stuff, and they say, I hope you have enough time to read this. Spirit doesn't read. Spirit doesn't read. You can't ever get overwhelmed with too much email if you're spirit. Because why? Because spirit doesn't read. It's all intuitive. You get ev all your answers from your intuition. You don't have to have little eyeballs passing over a bunch of words. There are people that are like intellectuals, and they believe that that's the way the scribes and Pharisees actually believe that too. You keep running your eyeballs and practicing rituals enough that you'll make it back to heaven. No, that's not going to even work. You can let go of that too. Are you willing to question your belief in exercise? Are you willing to question your belief in nutrition? Are you willing to question all the beliefs of time and space? Lesson 189 from the Course, simply do this, be still and lay aside all thoughts of what you are and what God is. And he goes on to say, hold on to nothing. Do not bring with you one thought the past has taught, or one thing you learned before from anything. Forget this world, forget this course, and come with open arms unto your God. Are you willing to transcend the course of miracles? Or are you going to stick with the belief that you're just going to be a human being reading and studying this, practicing this book for years and years and years to come. I've heard teachers say, you know, the Course is not something that can be experienced in a lifetime. Who invented the concept of lifetimes? How many lifetimes are there in one? I go to Unity churches all over the world and I'm giving a talk there and and I kept hearing, nobody would ever die. You know, in Unity Churches, nobody dies. They just make their transition. So I finally go to the minister in the congregation, I say, what's this transition stuff? Nobody ever dies, but they keep transitioning. Where are they transitioning to? The other side. The other side? How many sides are there in Unity? Come on! Your church name is Unity. What are you talking about sides? That's dualistic. Are you willing to just simply go for this and give your life over to it like it's the only thing that there is, really, that you can give your life to? Like that story of the, the Master in India. Welcome. Come on in. You got chairs here, down here. You can sit in the front. <laughs> no, no problem. There's that old story about the, the master who has the devotee and they go to the river and then the master takes the devotee and dunks the devotee under the water and holds the devotee under the water 
for quite a while, and then finally the devotee comes up <laughs> with a giant gasp for air. <laughs> and then the master says, when you want enlightenment, self-realization, as much as you just wanted that breath of air, you'll know it. You'll have it. It has to be the desire. You have to put spirit, love, peace of mind first. And you have to mean it. You, you can't just throw it in there and say, okay, it's going to be, uh, I'll put it in my top 20 <laughs> of priorities, you know. You can't, it's not going to, it's not going to actualize, it's not going to ignite if it's somewhere in your top 20. It has to be at the top spot. And then everything else just flows in from that. Everything that you seem to need. Those are my concerns at the beginning. I'm like, I'm back and forth with Jesus. I'm talking to Jesus and I'm saying, well, I don't know about, you know, I, I'm in my 20s, you know, I'm thinking like career is kind of important when you're in your 20s. You're supposed to start thinking about it nowadays when you're a child and they start thrilling you. <laughs> Get your skills, get your skill set and, you know, the right teachers and get your basics and math. And, and, but you're supposed to, by the time you're in your 20s, you're supposed to really be serious about a career. And Jesus is like, no, can you, are you willing to suspend that belief and, and trust that I'll provide for you? Not your past learning, not your jobs, not your skills, not your education. All the things we're taught that you got to have in place to have a career to provide for yourself. I'll tell you one thing, that's one of the sneakiest traps to spiritual awakening, is the belief that you have to provide for yourself, because you don't even know who yourself is, how could you provide for yourself? That's a wheel of thinking that you know enough from your own past learning and your skills and abilities to get you out of time and space. Somehow you think, oh, I'm pretty good, I'm a successful person, I'm a good candidate for spiritual awakening. Jesus is like, no. You're twice removed from reality. If you think you're successful in this world, you're twice removed from where this is heading. I, w I would travel around the world and meet people that were alcoholics, drug addicts, that were had sex addictions, that were, had lives filled with pain and suffering and misery and addictions. But all of that drove them down to their knees finally and they fell down to their knees and their knees hit the ground and they cried out sincerely, help, things have gotten really out of hand here, I need a better way. And then they would go to a 12 step group, get involved with Course in Miracles, all the great healing modalities that the Spirit uses and they would go soaring after they were knocked down to their knees first. If you think you're a successful person in this world, you are twice removed from reality. Don't look down on those addicts. Don't look down on those people that have been driven to their knees because they're only once removed from reality. You cannot judge your advances <coughs> from your retreats. <coughs> Whatever you think you have built to make you better in this world has actually been barriers against the truth barriers against the light of love. You have to come down to your knees. You have to come down to a state of humbleness, of true humbleness, modesty, really to understand, I do not know. You have to come to that, I do not know moment, and I need help. And then, from that point, the spirit ignites in you, and the soul ignites and soars up to its natural condition of perfect love and unity. So everything in this world is backwards and upside down. Absolutely everything without exception. Can you mix the world's teachings with the Spirit's teachings? Absolutely not. You cannot mix light and darkness. You cannot mix love and fear. What did the Bible teach us years ago? Perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love doesn't say romantic love casts out fear. It doesn't say occasional love casts out fear. It's perfect love, agape love, unconditional love casts out fear. Again, it's very simple, but you have to give your heart to this. 
Now, in my life, the parable of David has just been, I basically came to an experience where Jesus told me, with, he had said this before with the apostles, and he said it for many, many years, many hundreds of years. But he said, freely you have received, now freely given. He doesn't say give in order to get something back. That's reciprocity. He doesn't say give occasionally. He asks you to become a true giver. Just like the flower gives off its fragrance. It doesn't tell the fragrance, tell the wind where to blow it. Blow it over to that cat, Sharon. I like that cow. I don't like that horse. Blow it over there. You know, that's more like human beings do with their love. You know, I'll love you because you treat me right. Treat me right, and I'll love you. No, that's not giving, and that's not love, because there's conditions. That's not unconditional love, there's conditions. The only way to be happy and joyful consistently is be to become a giver like God gives. God didn't give and then say, okay, what do you got for me? You know? It was just a free gift. So I decided that I thought, well, I'm going to have some fun here with planet Earth. I'm going to become a giver. So when I was told, freely you have received, freely give, that's why I started to use things like the internet, and before there was an internet, just start to extend resources and so on and so forth. And, and, and in more recent years, it's like record things just because I can put them on to the web and let people listen to them at their own time for free. The only time that things came in, people started telling me, you know, people, if it's free, it doesn't have any value, because money is the standard of this world. So if you don't have a price on it, so I thought, well, if you have to reach some segment, but everything is given freely, and then do what you want with it after that. But it has to be made available freely, because it's a free gift. It's the grace of God. And can we not get into that mentality where our life becomes about freely giving and extending? And that's the focus of our life. And we trust the Spirit will handle everything else. And that's what St. Francis did, and that's what the, the mystics and saints have done, the sannyasis in India. They would basically just go out. They were like wandering saints and mystics, letting the grace of God pour through them and trusting that everything would be handled. That's what inspired me was the story of the, life, the saints and the mystics that, would, that did that. I thought, wow, what a demonstration. That's so far beyond capitalism, socialism, all the isms of the world. You know, it's just, it's so simple. Show up in love. Live the Beatitudes. Extend the grace of God. And then trust and watch how everything is handled. It works with everything. If I need a word, God will give it to me. If I need a thought, God will give it to me. If I need whatever. You know, it's, it's, to me it's, it's just become all the same now, so I just, I just have a, wear a smile on my face. Like even coming up here, you know, I'm walking up to board my plane and I've got my coach ticket in my hand, you know, printed boarding pass, and I go there and I go to the counter and they, they scan it. You know, you got to scan it before you walk down the run, the thing to get on the plane. They scanned it and then they, Delta has this thing where they give you automatic upgrades. They, they, she pulled out another ticket and gave me another ticket and, and it was first class. I, went, I walked in on the plane, it was the last first class ticket available, I thought. It'd be another great day in <laughs> Vancouver. Upgraded to first class. Yeah. Oh my God. I mean, but the, the thing about it is, there's not really nothing better to coach first class, but it's just like, when you give yourself over to Spirit, to shine the light of Spirit, there will be symbols, because you believe in symbols, that will come your way. And it's basically just saying, God's saying, I got your back. Oh, I love you so much. I got you. I got you. The Spirit provides the symbols. The Spirit provides the symbols. You don't work for the money and to, so you can attain and gain all these symbols, because that's egoic. You simply decide you're going to be happy, and you decide you're going to follow Spirit, and let all things else be added unto you, without any effort. 
Think of the life you would have if you went through entire days, no, let's say entire weeks and months, without thinking of money at all. Wouldn't that be fun to just have, let's see, to be happy with ten minutes, <laughs> a half an hour. <laughs> Ah! I didn't, think, I didn't think of money for a half an hour. Oh, I'm on my way. But imagine living your life where you had, where you just saw that the whole world was symbolic, and that it was all you, and it was all provided uh, for whatever would serve shining the light of love. It was just props, like a theater, just props being used to shine the light of love, with no value in and of itself, just images that were swirling around like leaves blowing in the wind with no interpretation of that, except you're just shining your light and love and going hugging people and singing, rejoicing in God's love. Like, actually, you can watch the birds at this time of year. You know, you see how they, they fly between the trees and they're chirping and singing. They're so happy. It's springtime. Yeah! Flying around. Look up on the wires. They're, they're like doing their mating things and all kinds of, it's all alive and it's all happy and they're all singing a happy tune. I've never met a, like a, a grumbling bird. <laughs> in the finger. They're always like chirp, 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 chirp. Uh, oh, I love that. It's fun to meditate to chirping birds, you know. It's a nice sound. They're happy. And St. Francis was the one who pointed out they, they don't need much. They eat a few berries a day. I mean, they're probably not even looking. They just probably run into a berry or a bug every once in a while. Go, oh, lunch. You know, they, they're not thinking, is that organic? <laughs> uh, you know, imagine how free your mind would be if you're like going around and, and it just shows up. That's how it works for the Aborigines in, uh, in Australia too. They go on walkabout. They're just rejoicing in the happiness of the present moment and then telepathically when, it's, when they get hungry, then an animal gives itself up to them and says, Oh, you happy people. Here you go. I'll be lunch today for you. <laughs> the, the fun and the joy of just starting to see it's all just symbols being used for the glory of God. And we don't have to break it apart into all these little divisions. This is right. This is wrong. This is better. In the end, there's a state of mind that goes beyond right and wrong. It goes even beyond better and worse. It goes beyond helpful and unhelpful. As you're going through your mind training, the spirit will still work with your mind and say, well, that's helpful, that's helpful, do this. It, it can guide you in all kinds of things. Diet, where to go, what to do. You know, it's very practical. The spirit is very practical. And, and it's so worth it when you get tuned into your intuition and guidance. It's the most wonderful thing you could ever do for your mind. Because from that point on, you're like on cruise control with spirit driving the, the car, so to speak. With spirit leading the way. There's nothing easier than living a life guided by spirit. And there's nothing more difficult than trying to hack it out with ego. And, and keep feeding the ego with its wants and greed and desires and then having these outcomes that you judge as terrible, disaster, you know, like the fires that were just up and not far from here over near Calgary and above. You know, was it good? Was it bad? There's a miracle available in how you see it. And that miracle is always available with whatever you're perceiving. There's always the miracle that's inspired by love that can see the blessing. So, yeah, I think I've been on for my spiel for a while now. <laughs> I like practical uh, questions, curiosities, uh, things from wherever you perceive you are in your life and wherever you perceive you are with this linear time thing. Um, you know, it doesn't take anything but the love and the willingness in your heart to say yes to Spirit, to say yes to God. You don't, God doesn't say, well, let me see your resume, and, you know, well, you've been loafing there a lot, and <laughs> now you're asking to work for me, you're asking for a job. The Spirit doesn't look at resumes. The Spirit doesn't look at your past and go, mm, I don't know about this one. 
Uh, we have, Nikita and I have fun because when Nikita first heard of me and everything, I think we had, did we have a phone call? We had a phone call right we were, the next she day. She was living in Canada. Applied. Yeah. And so she applied to come down to Utah and we were living in Canada. And I think the last job that you had was working in a bar. In, I was in a, a bar. bartender at a club. Night she was club. at a bartender at a club, not a, a, a nun in a convent. <laughs> <laughs> a bartender in a club. Not and as far as money, resources, mm, no. She was the first one where the Spirit said, buy her a ticket. I went, Ooh, <laughs> buy her a ticket. Okay. That's That's right. <laughs> I never met you. The Spirit said, buy her a ticket. Okay. So, no money. Last job, working in a bar. You're at your apartment and it's kind of wrapping up. And you've told me before, you said you had no redeeming skills or abilities. <laughs> At all? Not that I knew of at a time. My, my last skill was, uh, that got it done, it was uh, bartending. bartending. I thought I was good at it, so there was, it was my okay. last standing. No money, so, no skills, so bartending that skills. That was, that was the was end so, of it, that was by, the, by the end of it I couldn't even count. And I was like, uh oh. And then I heard, well that's your last night, so. And how many years ago was this? Are we talking in That was terrible? exactly four years ago, because exactly ago. in May. Well, it's June. It was May. I came, like, I came to Utah on May 13th, 2012. So it was right around this time that the whole transition was happening. So uh, those are all the things that you didn't have. And then, and basically, what is the Course in Miracles? What is all spirituality about, about being attentive to your mind? being attentive to your mind, to your heart, to your emotions, mind watching, you know, disciplining the mind. We have to have discipline to drive a car, to drive, ride a bike, you know, to bake a cherry pie. We have to have some kind of, we have to have some kind of discipline. We just don't go and look and stare at the oven and wait. You may come to that point where you do that. You might be like, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking cherry pie tonight. <laughs> I'm thinking warm cherry pie. Oh no, that's more like, that's more like Sai Baba. <laughs> it's made you just symbols though. You won't even care, you know. It's like oh yeah, another cherry pie. But it was like for you, it was it, it was part of unearthing the ego, facing things, you know, trust. I think it was it was trust, even though. When you came and you got off the plane, I always tell that story too. Where some time had passed, where I went to the monastery and I was over there. We had these two ponds, and one was drained and turned into a little mini amphitheater, but there was another pond next to it. And Akita was standing in the middle of the pond with it looked like a like a mop or some kind of some kind of mop or, mop or something or like this. Something. And she's in the middle and she's going like this, and, and I'm looking at her and I said, <laughs> "So what are you doing?" She said, I'm cleaning the rocks. This was inside the pond. <laughs> and I just thought, oh, there she is trusting. She is trusting to come out in the middle of rural Utah and get a mop and stand in a, in a little pond. And, and I thought, but see, that impressed me because I thought, there's some trust going on there. She's trusting. I'm not talking about blind faith, but I mean just the trust to let yourself be taken out of what seems to be your circumstances and your story and your way of life and your opinions and conclusions and trust that there's going to be a crack and opening for another way, which would be what I'll call it God's plan, to forgive everything that you think you know. And it takes a lot of determination too to hang in there, because when the ego starts to flare up, that's when you want to go back to the old survival strategies, bolt, do this, distract away, addictions, you know, all the things the ego has, a whole plethora of, of defenses against love. And you have to have the commitment to say, no thank you. I'm going to open my heart up, I'm going to move through this darkness and come into the light. So that took a lot of determination too. Yeah, throughout the years, like throughout the four years, definitely. Yeah. Like, it's a uh, good example. especially past year, if we want to talk about it. So that was nothing but that. I don't know if, if any of you have seen Insurgents. Mm -hmm. 
It was like this. That was your insurgent. <laughs> that year. was exactly. You were Tris <laughs> for like, one year. I <laughs> one word for insurgent. Yeah. <clears throat> Something shifting now, though. Yeah. So I don't know what, but yeah, but something shifting. So I'm just open. Yeah. Not what, but it's kind of. I have a lot of gratitude. But that's funny because we were testing the screen the other day here, and it just so happened I was testing it with insurgent. Would I be like mm. later? I was like, oh, what is this going on, Tris? You're hurting Tris. You know, like, huh? And uh, and it, I, I just had like almost like a moment of like almost like I wanted to tear up because it was so. I'm like, I love this movie so much. Like I had a lot of gratitude because it was like. Like it was a deep face because it was insurgent like through the whole year like not like almost like nothing but just really like facing everything all the values all the like going like as deep as you possibly can it can allow with the spirit and face everything all the values like even like loss of a loved one like she had to let go for uh, like everything like the po the worst possible things and that your worst fears. And uh, and not knowing where it's gonna take and not have a plan and it's mm -hmm. like and every so often be like I need a reminder like it's kind of like what what's going on and um, and so like I said but like when I was testing the screen I just had a lot of gratitude that it was like you know something I could feel almost like uh, I'm starting to forget last <coughs> year so it's like almost like like you wake up and it's like whoa what a dream like that so it, it's starting to become like uh, from what was so horrific and all, all the horrible things and it started to feel like oh like even like talking about it almost like did it really happen kind of like sometimes I feel like well, it happened, like almost like really uh, but 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 it was all for mind training and then like oh yeah of course this is what it's all about like in the end like this is like a course in miracles nothing real can be threatened nothing unreal exists and then it's practical too how much do you want to actually like experience that how dare are you like do you dare to really experientially find out that nothing real can be threatened and just like go how deep do you want to go with it not in the conceptual way and so and then of course everything like when there's a desire for it like everything is given like in terms of form I had the most gentle backdrop even in the most like what you know like could be like um, my win place which was in Utah in Camas but it's like so well it was everything um, like given in such a way and gentleness in terms of the form so that the mind can just totally allow and go you know <coughs> for what it truly wants which is like uh, the peace of the peace of God like to truly like I want to know like the truth so yeah so you know that that uh -huh. that's a trilogy you know with Tris and the, the divergent was the first one insurgent was the second one Divergent, you know, when she would go through these great trials in that movie, uh, and the other candidates would always have to face the fears and this and this, but, but they, they had a great difficulty with it. The way she would transcend fear was just the simple thought, it's not real. She was in the miracle, transcending the fear, while the other candidates or the other ones that were part of it were just, how are you doing this? What is your secret? How, how can you go into that fearless state? It was, it was she would go into this. It's not real. She would she would go into the miracle, and then of course the second one, insurgent. You know she had to face all her deepest fears, and then the third one. The thing about it was I was traveling and people were I saw critics saying, "Oh, the young people today, they're not going to see the third part of the trilogy." The critics were projecting onto the young people. They're so fickle uh -huh. and that, and I said, "No." If I thought if the young people aren't seeing it, it's not worth seeing. Because yeah. everybody had that experience with the Matrix. You see the first Matrix, and you go, wow, it's all there in Matrix number one. And then, oh well, then there's, it, it diverts <laughs> a little bit. The thing about it is, the mind gets witnesses to what it truly wants. And, and I think we have a symbol of a lot of young people that are kind of getting wise to the ways of this world. And when they see all the twists went through in number two, they're like, got it. Lesson learned. Thank you for the direction. I don't have to go 
and continue watching more movies, I can really get the lesson, really face the fear and go through it. It's the same with therapy. It's the same with psychotherapy, transpersonal therapy. Listen, the, listen to the name, transpersonal. It's to transcend the personal. It's not called wallow in the personal therapy, <laughs> although sometimes people treat it like wallow in the personal. Because why? It makes money. But what's the money for? You know, Jesus says, what, what are you doing? Why are you earning these, he calls them, strips of green paper strips and piles of metal disc? He's pretty detached from money. Strips of green paper strips and piles of metal disc. He says you use these strips of, of paper strips to buy things that you don't even need and want. Doing things jobs that you don't even need or want. And then you keep recycling, you just do it over and over again. Never stopping to question, where is it all going to end? What's it all for? You keep hearing that people say, I'm stressed out, it's higher taxes, and there's traffic problems, oh my god, there's more traffic congestion, and you know how long it took me to get to work, and, uh, and what are you working for? What is the point of your work? What is the point of your vocation, your occupation, you have to start to ask those questions. What is it for? What is this vocation for? If it's just to earn green paper strips and buy senseless things and let them go and buy some more and keep going through this recycling of things and then grow old, get sick and die. Come on, you think that's the point of life? You know, is that, I mean, that seems to be the mass consciousness, but really, come on, let's be real here, is that really the point of life? Live it out as the best you can and then get grow old, get sick and die. You know, if that's all that the world has to offer you, then I think with A Course in Miracles you can start to say, oh, there's more. There's definitely more. It's called enlightenment. It's called an awakening. It's called forgiveness. It's called healing. It's very important, coming to peace of mind. So that's why you have to put that first. You can't really come into full experience of peace of mind if you try to straddle, you try to straddle between two different thought systems, one of love and one of fear. You can't say, glory to God, glory, you know, Jesus said, many will come in my name and say, Jesus, Jesus, Lord, and he will say, I know you not. What does that even mean? It means, if you really into serving Christ, then you're not going to be a peaceful warrior. Why? Because that's a contradiction in terms. You're not going to stick with this old thing of fight the good fight. Who says spirit has its fighting at all? I mean, it seems that way when you're pulling your mind away from the ego. It seems like a battle, an internal battle, a psychic battle that's going on. But in the end, what does Jesus say in the Course? Truth does not fight against illusions, nor do illusions battle with the truth. Illusions battle only with themselves. If you have a conflicted mind, you have to admit that you're still trying to serve two masters. And you can't serve love and money. You can't serve love and fear. You can't serve love and guilt. You have to give your mind's full attention to the love. and let it be pulled away from the, the guilt, and so forth. Aren't you happy to hear a teaching that comes out in, in the psychotherapy pamphlet where Jesus has a very short little sentence, money is nothing, period, from Jesus Christ. Is Jesus Christ into capitalism? No. Socialism? No. Any isms? No. Money is nothing. Could you live that? Could you actually use this seeming lifetime to give your mind permission to live that? Where you're so divinely guided, you're so tuned in to the flow of all that is, that you're not obsessive about saving money, spending money, earning money. You know, how many thoughts a day go through the mind that are tied into those money concepts. 
That's, that's a waste of your mind energy, actually. What's the solution? If you give those thoughts over to the Holy Spirit and say, I don't know what to do with these, but here you go. I give them to you and you give them back to me as guidance that's practical. Oh, you need to leave a tip there. Oh, you forgot your wallet. Oh, I've got a new job for you that's going to help you pay off your debts. Oh, you know, you, you give the thoughts of scarcity and lack. You give the money thoughts and the financial thoughts over to the Spirit and you say, wow, my plan did not work at all. <laughs> I've been really tangled up into this complexity of trying to learn how to, you know, be a successful human being, which is really an oxymoron again. Uh, when you're a spirit, you'll never be a successful human being, a successful person. You've got to, you've got to take that concept, give it to spirit, and say, now it's your plan. Be you in charge. Some of you remember the Course in Miracles, how the workbook ends. This holy instant, what I give to you. Be you in charge. I would but follow. That's how the workbook ends. As you're letting go of your daily practice. And he's saying, now let the Holy Spirit take you from here. He's got you. These lessons have just helped you make the connection with the Spirit. Now give it over to the Spirit and let the Spirit orchestrate that. How many of us grew up trying to figure out what we wanted to be when we grew up? Like, how many of us still or wondering, <laughs> or wondering if we should ever grow up at all. Maybe, maybe that was the problem. <laughs> if we were playing in, you know, in the creek when we were little and laughing all the time, then we wonder, maybe I was in the wrong turn trying to become a, a, a functioning human being, adult human being. Maybe that was the turn. I need to, you know, become as little children. Jesus said, meaning just become as dependent on spirit as little infants are to their mother. Little infants are very dependent on the mother and father. Become that dependent on your guidance, on the Spirit. And then as you go in that direction, then it, it becomes quite joyful because basically then you are being called out of the world. You're being called into a, a new way of seeing the world. Lately I've been recording the workbook lessons from A Course in Miracles, and today the one that I put out was um, only an instant from, the, from this workbook, only an instant does the world endure. Isn't that fascinating from Jesus? Only an instant does the world endure. He has got a lot to say. This is a thought that can this is the thought that lets you know that everyone who comes here um, comes here to suffer and die. And yet, this is the thought that can heal your mind because only an instant does the world endure starts to take you into a new perception of time. The transference from the unholy instant, the time of terror and fear, to the holy instant. The present moment where you're free and innocent. That's the one little tweak you've got to make in, in the mind. That's the only t thing the whole spiritual journey is about, is, is making that little tweak from, from fear to love, from the unholy instant to the holy instant. What does that mean in a practical way? Because I, I was reading that lesson and I'm like, oh, I love this lesson. This, this lesson is basically saying, only an instant does this world endure. It's basically saying that, that Time was over, and the only struggle you have is trying to perpetuate this belief in linear time. When it's been handled by the Holy Spirit, it's already over and done. It's been handled. It's not a future thing, it's already over and done. But as long as you keep perpetuating this belief in linear time, past, present, future, you are bringing guilt and fear and shame and pain and denying eternity, which knows nothing of this past, present, future construct. And what it's really saying is, if you can just for an instant see this world as, as simultaneous, simultaneous, then you, that is the gateway to eternal life and freedom. And how does that relate to us as we're on the journey? Because what we were driving yesterday, Helena was asking about, she was saying, 
what experiences have you had in your life that have been symbols of undoing linear time? And I was telling her some of the most profound ones that I've had. But let's just think of a word that human beings know. Spontaneous or spontaneity. A lot of times we think of children as being very spontaneous. Not like everything's pre-planned and preconceived. They're just very spontaneous. They wear their heart on the sleeve. They're just very, very in the moment. That's what spontaneous means. And imagine if you could live a life of trust where you completely lived your life in 100% spontaneity, with no preconceptions, no past ideas of what was coming next, no prejudgments, no agendas, no underlying assumptions that were hovering underneath. No kind of program running underneath. You could be just completely spontaneous and, and greet the world with that spontaneity and the spirit within your heart. That's the goal of spirituality, to live in, in that pure spontaneity. Joyful, happy, happy, free spontaneity. You see what a contrast that is to the human construct learning, planning, striving, concept, image, agendas, you know, so on and so forth. All of that is an egoic block to that spontaneity. Now I will find that also there are people, the ego is so clever and so ingenious that anything that's true and real and helpful, the ego will make a counterpart to throw you off. It's that much of a, of a clever trickster. So what is the ego's counterpart for spiritual spontaneity? What clever defense would the ego throw in to throw you off the trail? Planning. Planning. But even planning is so, such a future thing, but let's draw even closer. What, what could the ego come up with that seems to be the moment, but it's just a substitute for the moment? Distraction, that's, a, that's almost describing it. Impulsivity. You see? Spontaneity, the ego comes sliding in with impulsivity. How many friends do you know that are on the spiritual journey and they go around, they're constantly talking about, I'm living in the now, 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 now. now. You live with a partner. Well, let's do this. Living in the now. Living in the now. Well, are we going to get out of bed or anything? <laughs> Living in the now. <laughs> Living in the now. You know, there's something about the ego is so clever, it will take Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, and it will make it into a cliche. <laughs> and see how clever the ego is. And now, it's the now. Everything's living in the now. Did you pay the mortgage bill? This? Living in the now. You know, it's like, you see, the ego will hijack... It's trying to hijack pure spontaneity with impulsivity, with ego impulsivity. You see how clever. That's why we have to really be honest. We have to come to a self-honesty because these spiritual cliches and catchphrases, the ego will just hijack them and then it will just, it'll be parroting these uh, concepts. It's, you were talking about undoing the concepts. It just turns into a concept. Right. So then suddenly, You've gone from actually living spontaneously in the now, which is what the whole point's about, to a fantasy concept of what the ego wants you to believe is the fantasy of living in the now. You see how sneaky it is? Just be aware of that. Candy. I don't think that this was between spontaneity and the belief. Right? Could you explain what the all kinds of, there, there are many different ego impulses in the mind. They're distorted miracle impulses. It's like taking your divine calling and running it through a filter of lack and craving. So when someone's impulsive, there's fear there. And they're trying to impulsively say the right thing, or do the right thing, or put on a good mask. You know, even, even spirituality, the ego will turn into a mask, so then it's so clever, then it has a spiritual mask. There's always comparisons and judgments. 
you know, it's kind of fascinating to me how personhood and, and spirituality get kind of licked up again and again. It's an oxymoron. I mean, I, I talked to a friend and they said, yeah, I just went out on a first date with this guy and I really liked him. And, uh, you know, the best thing about our dinner was uh, he's spiritual. <laughs> he's spiritual. I thought, how do you do that? You know? <laughs> That could be a trap too, if you think you know someone spiritual and, and nobody and nobody else is. This one, of all the candidates, this one's spiritual. You know, it, you start to see that we throw these words together: spiritual man, spiritual woman. You know, those things are trying to again mix spirit and matter, spirit and flesh. When we're actually asked to be very honest with our feelings and emotions, am I feeling joyful? Am I feeling happy, peaceful? That's what spirit is, is that state of mind. It's not these things. Well, vegetarian, he's organic, and he seems fit, and da, 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 and, and he's spiritual. You know, it's like, wait a minute, it's, you've got, we've got to let go of all of our categories in order to know thyself, in order to recognize that, that the form is not it. Even the Sutras and, and Buddhism, you know, form is empty, empty is form. You, you get to the same place that the Course is taking us, is don't try to read the meaning onto the form. That's lesson number two. I have given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me. And he's going to take it much further than that. I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. Yeah, the, the, it's urgency with fear, whereas we've all had those experiences too, where when something lights up our heart, and there's like a change coming, and we feel a sense of like urgency, like the spirits saying, you know, trust me, this is an important leap. So there can be an urgency that's underneath there, not with a sense of fear or panic, but a sense of like, I'm calling you, I'm really calling you out of the world. And a lot of times people who go on the spiritual journey, you know, they're, they're saying, oh, these teachings of Jesus and Buddha, and so these are radical, you know, sell all that you have, give to the poor, and follow me, and, and uh, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all else will be added unto you. Actually, those aren't radical. Those are very simple, direct instructions from the Master. And it's only the ego that says those are too radical. But as I followed them myself and, and dove into them, I found the bliss. Well, that's what those instructions lead to is absolute bliss. And then, interestingly, I, there was, the mind was calling for a symbol. So basically they, people say, well, you know, do you, like, do you live with someone? Do you live in community? Do you live with a partner? Do you live with a, listen, the whole universe becomes your community when you're in this state of mind because there's no world apart from your mind. It's, it's what they call unified consciousness. So really you're in love with everyone, and that's the matter of fact of how it is, because you're not judging anyone as being separate or apart from yourself. You're letting go of the personal identification. It, how it plays out in the world, Jesus had uh, 12 apostles. It seemed that we seem to have a community, I, I lose track of the numbers, but it's like 20, 25, I don't know. These we don't days, know. It say it's around 25 to 30. 25 to 30 around the world, but around the world. but it's just those are just symbols too of devotion, of living a devoted life where you're pouring yourself into your purpose and your function, and you are willing to let go of the time ideas. You're willing to let go of the the scarcity ideas, the lack ideas, where you're willing to trust that you're living in divine providence and everything's being provided. Uh, sometimes the word mystic is used, or mysticism. Mystic to me it just means devotion to God. It's not a special term, it's not a special 
concept or whatever. It's just another term for devotion to spirit. That's what the goal is, is to be devoted. The form is very individualized. You know, the spirit will arrange time and space and will handle all the form. So you don't have to get into the struggles of comparing this with that. That's where the, the judgments come in. My ego wants to ask a question now. The question is, how does the concept of romantic love fit into this? It's inside of the Course. Well, I would say there's those nine chapters on specialness from 15, chapter 15 to 24. And I had a friend who used to live up in Roscoe, New York with Ken Wapnick and was part of the community up there for years. And she was in the kitchen. And she would say every time they would do workshops on that particular topic that you're raising, people, they'd have to order like four times as much food. So people were jamming their mouths with food for however five days a week, and she's in the kitchen trying to keep up <laughs> with everything, you know. So when they get into those, that question, that theme, it's charged with lots of fear. It's charged with lots of guilt. There's a huge defense mechanism that's there tied in with it, and that's why people would just stuff their mouths, because they, they weren't ready to face that. They had a, something to distract with, so the food was the way. What I would say is that as you believe in time and space, the Spirit is so gracious and loving that it will use the concepts that the mind believes in. And so, you're dealing with, starting off with relationship. You're talking about a, a romantic, sexual, maybe committed, monogamous, maybe not, you know, people nowadays, you know, his whole, when you talk about romantic relations, are we talking polyamory, or, you know, you have to get specific what you're talking about, but that's going to be a starting point for healing. What can we say about how the Holy Spirit can use what the ego made? Is There's a lot of mirroring that's going to go on. Because what happens is when you start to throw in concepts like commitment and relationships and, and monogamy and different things like that, those are concepts too. And they're there's a lot of mirroring that goes on, and what really is happening there is it's intensifying the mirroring. In other words, let's say there's, you know, billions of people, and you've, you've noticed that your mind is focused on the behavior of this partner. Where they are, what they're doing, looks on their faces, you know, all these things start to take exaggerated importance not so concerned with the rest of the six billion, seven billion. You, you're concerned with what's going on right in front of you. And the concern around that is you're perceiving what you still believe. So there's an intense mirroring that goes on in those significant other romantic relationships. And the Spirit is going to use that if you're willing to trust the Spirit and say, I'm giving this over to you to use for spiritual awakening, to free my mind of, of this guilt. Yes? Spirit, Spirit just spoke to me. What I got is that that person is like a gift to teach to teach you. That's who that yeah. person is. Yes. Yeah, that's the Spirit. Deserving it. Me. It's so a gratitude. perfect gratitude. gift for, for you, for yeah. me. Yes. It's a perfect gift to learn what I need to learn. Unwind what I need to unwind. Thank you. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Like, yeah. Shoot. <laughs> I got it. I got it. Thank you. You ask the question and just your willingness and then shoot comes right in. Yes. Hi Dave, I have a question about the living spontaneous. How can we keep balance between living spontaneously and also being vigilant? Because um, living spontaneously it could be um, abused by untrained mind. Because uh, currently I'm living with some kids, I don't have kids, but I live in relatives, so I see the kids, so they don't have self-control. So, um, at, at one hand, we talk about... We're asking it. Helena's question right behind you. She, <laughs> she's like, well, yeah. thank God. <laughs> thank God somebody's <laughs> raising this one up. So, one, one mind. <laughs> yeah. So, the, uh, the, even the Buddhism talk about the deep discipline, 
And the course also talk about the, like uh, the, the ego has such a continuity things, it keeps going. So we need kind of a risk of vigilance, you know, we, we, we need a kind of a discipline. So, um, I, but I understand when you talk about uh, living spontaneously, that means we don't need a plan, we don't need to think about too much time, the need to wait, feel worry about the future, regret the past. Yes. Um, the same idea pretty much like the, another, another concept they talk about in China, it's about the low people pleasing. So I understand that the, the profound of this one, but it can also be misused, yes. you know, by ego. Yes. So between the discipline, between the you know discipline and the living spontaneously, can you talk about more how we can keep that balance? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was talking about before too, with the spontaneity and the impulsivity. The impulsivity would be the the defense, like the ego misusing the spontaneity for its own purposes. And I would say that you, Jesus says an untrained mind can accomplish nothing. This is a course in mind training. The whole focus is on mind training. So really that's a, a very key point, that if you begin to use everything for mind training, you have to, you'll become much more aware of these tricks as, as you become more mindful, is a word that, that they use in Buddhism, you become more attentive and focused. So. The same with people pleasing, you know, the ego can use that to interpret it for its own ways of um, I'm not going to do what other people want. Um, there's not a sense of real joining and connecting and asking internally what is helpful here. It's just the ego will jump on that and try to say I'm just going to do it my way and I'm, I'm not going to care about what other people think or do, but it can be very egocentric and so the ego is very clever at doing these things. Now, when you talk about, like children, we were having those discussions, children are called little monkeys today, and <laughs> uh, so on and so forth. You start to realize that everything in your life is, is an opportunity for you to undo the self-concept and let go of control. So, for example, when I was in South America, I was out in the rural areas years ago, and, and uh, a lot of the women were had children, young children, and they said, the young children are teaching us so much. They're working with the Course. They're learning from the young children. And I said, what is it that they're teaching you? And they said, that this game of control is over. Uh, <laughs> you think you have a bigger body, that you're in control of my smaller body? Mm -hmm. I'm here to teach you a major lesson and I'll do everything I have in my, my power to teach you that's not the case. That's the undoing of the parent concept. That's the undoing. There's a lot of control that's built into every self-concept of the world. You're a manager in a business. Are there control issues there? You better believe it. You're the president of a, con a country. Are there control issues? Yes. You're the CEO of a company. You have under unconscious control issues? You better believe it. People don't like that when they, they, they say, can, can somebody who's the CEO of a of a company be enlightened? I said, absolutely not. Because there's so many concepts that are built in with these masks that they're all based on control. And anybody familiar with the 12-step program, you know, the serenity prayer, what you have control over, what you don't have control over, and the wisdom to know the difference. Jesus makes the serenity prayer very clear in the Course when he says, you have no control over the world you make is because the ego made the world. So it's trying to control the children is where the problem comes in. Even trying to control the body still is giving reality to the body. Trying to control the world. The human being is a construct which is this impossible situation where there seems to be an external environment and this body, and then inside the body. And things are not always in accord. You know, there's always seems to be friction between the individual and society. There seems to be friction between this person and that person. Even with soulmates, you know, you go for 30 years, you find your soulmate, you go, ha, ah, I've got my soulmate. And then you wake up in the morning one, in bed one day, and you go, what? You believe what? And then you're like, oh, come on, this is, you're crushing my soulmate <laughs> concept too, you know. The spirit will always undo every concept that we believe in, because that's where the conflict's coming in. 
What's the conflict? Am I a creation of God, or can I make myself any damn well way I want myself to be? That's what the projected world is, is I want to make myself in any way that I want to be. I can be Caucasian, I can be Oriental, I can be Russian, I can be male, female. Oh, let's try a little, little bit of both. I'm going to be a trans transgender, I'll switch in mid, mid force and blah, blah, blah. There's a, there's a belief under there that I can make myself any way I want to be. And that's the authority problem. That's saying, I can be the author of me. And Spirit's saying, no, God is the author. God created you as perfect, innocent Spirit. And that's the reality of things. So, what the answer to your question is, if, if you start to feel that, that there's been a hijacking or a misuse of something, and even around something like spontaneity, because that can be like a parent saying, listen, I'm going to do laissez-faire hands-off. Just do whatever you want. You want to watch TV? Here's the remote. <laughs> Pay-per-view? Go ahead. Spend as much money as you want. Uh, rated R, rated X, I don't care. You know, it's this and this. I had students years ago in the 1990s, and, and it was so interesting because there were this couple one was into the Course and following my teachings, one was not, the husband was not. They had two children, and uh, the husband would kind of hear the things I would say, and then would watch his wife, because the wife would say, well, I'm gonna, I don't want to, I don't feel comfortable showing the children certain kind of movies, and certain violent kind of things, and this and this and this. And intuitively she was feeling that she really wanted to work with her children directly, and and be very selective in the kind of things that they were exposed to and the things that they watched in free time and this and this. And her husband would say, no, no, listen to David. It's all an illusion anyway. They can watch anything they want to, you know? And, and, this. and so it was this conflict between the intellectual ideas versus intuitive listening. What feels helpful? What feels right? So I did a whole talk, uh, a whole weekend, uh, some years ago over in Sweden, out in rural Sweden, on parenting and spirituality. Because I had a group of parents that were coming together and they were saying, can you help us start to take a closer look at these issues that are coming up with the children? Mostly the children just were out playing while we were doing it, but then they were coming for some of the talks too. But it was all about undoing the self-concept. Letting go of this idea of control over others of responsibility for other people as well. Because the Course takes us all the way back to the Atonement. Your sole responsibility is to accept the Atonement for yourself. Accept the correction for the Ego. Accept your alignment with Spirit. That's the answer. And the Ego is constantly projecting that one responsibility out into, I'm responsible for my country, my society, my children, my parents. You know, it's always trying to project responsibility, and that's where a lot of the people-pleasing comes in. Where the mind gets so caught up into a false identity, and doesn't even realize that it's a false identity. So, what I would say is, that as you really open the Spirit, the Spirit can move very quickly with your mind, if you're willing, to shift things. And maybe what we'll do this afternoon, too, is, I can talk I don't know how many people here are into quantum physics, but I can talk about the difference between Newt Isaac Newton and Newtonian physics, and in quantum physics. We can get more into Einstein and, and the last seven decades of quantum physici physicists, because what they're doing is they're showing us that it's all consciousness, that it's basically, that there is no external world apart from consciousness, apart from the thoughts, and it, it truly comes down to, to be the witness self, to come into the quantum field that they're talking about, the unified field. We have to let go of everything that we've perceived from Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics was based on false assumption. It was based on empiricism. It was based on an external world outside of consciousness. That's why when people tell me, you know, well, I, I need evidence for this spiritual stuff. You know, studies have shown about nutrition, studies have shown about sleeping, studies have shown about 
uh, exercise. Studies have shown, David, studies have shown, yeah, what are all these studies based on? Newtonian physics. They're all erroneous because they all are based on the assumption, the entire scientific method, as we've come to know, which many of us have grown up with, is based on the assumption that there's an external world and that you can <coughs> learn from experimenting with that projection, which doesn't, it's not seen as just a projection. It seems like it's reality, and we're going to deduce facts based on studying the images. It doesn't work. So this will save you thousands of years <laughs> if, you, if you stay with me, because you can start to let go of of all these studies and all this so-called factual basis, which are all based on false cause-effect relationships that don't even have any existence at all, and you can come back to your intuition, which is, what is my heart telling me? What is my heart telling me to eat? What is my heart telling me to do? What, what do I have by following my heart? There is no sacrifice in following your intuition. But we have to be really clear on, on what that intuition is, too. Because, like you're saying, the ego is so clever, it will try to hijack even intuition. I've had even people in spiritual circles of the Course, it, you know, the funniest thing in the early years for me was, my Holy Spirit and your Holy Spirit. My Holy Spirit's telling me this. What's your Holy Spirit telling me? Oh my God. And then they try to form communities based on, on this stuff. What, are we going to have a vote of the Holy Spirits then? <laughs> okay, five to four. Five Holy Spirits here. Four over there, the five win. Okay. You know, this is, it makes a mockery of, it's trying to bring the truth into the illusion until you come to an actual experience of divine guidance. If you just try to use the words, you know, I'm guided to do this. What are you guided to do? That can be helpful to start to tune into it, but you see how clever the ego is. It breaks the Holy Spirit into six billion Holy Spirits. And no wonder there's still conflict, because there isn't six billion Holy Spirits, there's only one. And that one is trying to take the mind, wake the mind up out of the sleep. Yes? Yeah, that's it. So the, the Holy that. Spirit keeps the message consistent, but it will reach people in, in the language that they can hear it and everything. But what would happen is, if you get into prayer, the topic of prayer, Jesus did that pamphlet, The Song of Prayer, and he said if, if two people are really attuned and listening, they will hear the same thing and, and, and even further at the same time. It can even come in. So. We, once we get into the topic of prayer, we start to go beyond the seeming perceived differences into the sense of harmony again. So, and I would say in the end, we were talking about that lesson, it's all for you. If you, if you keep it really simple, just between you and spirit, while you're waking up and seeing that it's all unified, then you take away the complexity of trying to judge anything for anyone else. Because ultimately, it comes directly into the mind, and you're given, you know, you give away the miracles that you receive. You first have to receive them before that you can give them away. So in terms of practicality, uh, yeah, it's it's the purpose. When people are using my Holy Spirit and your Holy Spirit, if, if it's for a purpose of maintaining differences and maintaining personal autonomy, then again, the ego has hijacked the whole thing. Yes? I just wanted to ask you a little bit about ego. Um, I'm starting to feel a bit sick in my tummy. It feels like there's a war going on when you talk about the ego and how sneaky it is, and how. And I just, I just feel like I'm out of sync with that. And if I've come to accept that maybe that ego is trying to keep me safe, but I'm hearing a different language from you, so I just, I'm just noticing my body. It's like, ooh, I'm, I'm in war right now with what you're saying about ego versus spirit, and I, I don't know where to go with that. Yeah, it's, it's uh, again, it's kind of like a purge. You know, if, if 
if a virus had got on your computer, no matter how undetected it is, you would want to be aware. You would want the virus scanner to pick it up. No matter how big the hard drive was or whatever, there's an unsettling thing. You have to find that. What I'm sharing is, is can be interpreted by the ego as a threat, because it sounds a little bit like the Bible, let your yea be yea, let your nay be nay. Uh, basically, Jesus is saying the Course, you will believe this Course entirely or not at all. Uh, that's extremely non-compromising. It's not a little myth, mishmash of the, a little of this, a little of that. And so, the interpretation can come in where the ego is very threatened uh, by the direction that all this is moving. And I would say that as people go on in in jobs and love relationships and in various aspects of life, they do start to come to that point where they feel an uneasiness, uh, like they're caught between worlds. There's a there's an inner an intra psychic battle or something going on that they maybe had distracted away from, but now it started to be brought more in awareness. Even this last year, I know with Nikita, she would just have days where just it was just pain. Not pain because of anything obvious in the environment, like she was saying, it all seemed serene and gentle, but there became like this intensity that started to come up. And if you read the lives of the mystics and the saints, you know, Saint John of the Cross, he would even talk about the dark night of the soul. When you start to drop in towards that unconditional love, the ego is going to try to put the brakes on. It will try to distract you from that pursuit, it will try to just, just deceive you, uh, turn you away from it, because because that's going to be the end of the ego. If you come into experience of love and light, there is no ego. And the ego does want to, it, it tries to exist, it wants an existence among, among everything else. So, it's, it's quite common, and I would say that when those uneasiness feelings, or the queasiness, or like a low-level anxiety, or different ways that it can come up, that you can recognize that there is a gift, like you were saying, it's a, that relationship is a gift, there is a gift there, and the gift is like a, a freeing from something, something being brought up into awareness that was hidden. That's the gift. Because as long as things remain hidden, then they're out of awareness, then the mind, the person is like a robot, just acting out the thoughts and beliefs and patterns. And, and it's, you know, trying to make the best of time and space, but we know that we're worth more than that. We don't have to just live a life just to make the best of it. We know that we're entitled to everything. We're entitled to, to true divine love, and that's really what's going on. So it's, a lot of it's committing and hanging in there, and I would say that's important on the spiritual journey. My question was around the dark night of the soul. Could you talk more about that? Well, it's just a phrase that, that St. John of the Cross came up with, but Dark Night of the Soul, it's, I would say it's, it's kind of like in Course in Miracles terms, you know, there's the obstacles to peace. You go through one, two, three, and then you come down to four, the fear of God, the fear of God, God's love. And that ultimately is, I think, what St. John of the Cross was describing. It's almost like that's the one you're going to have to pull your allegiance away from it entirely. Or as Jesus sometimes says, he says in the Course, do not attempt to breathe life into your failing ego. You know, it's like, you've been <laughs> mind training for years, we'll say centuries, millennium, you know, and now you're getting close to the light. And he goes, like, please. <laughs> no, please, don't, don't do it, don't pull the plug. It was this monster roaring, I've got you, you'll never escape from me. Now you're getting down to, don't pull the plug. <laughs> it's whimpering. <laughs> you know? And and that's like, that's kind of when you're, when you're past the dark night, now <laughs> do not breathe life into your failing ego. You know, just really go for it, go the, go the extra step. Finish it. <laughs> kill it. Let's finish it. Not kill it, because see, it likes a fight. Oh. If you try to kill it, then it goes, oh, <laughs> a fight? You want to fight me? 
<laughs> you have to forgive it, you know, which is, means just keep exposing it. That's why we have two guidelines in our communities, no private thoughts, no people pleasing, is just to encourage the exposure of the ego, uh, so that you can come into true empathy, which is just staying with what's what is right and true and given from spirit, staying with the guidance. 